Hello everyone, Nathaniel Gavronsky here, and I'm in Cordon, Iowa, in Wayne County. Now, Cordon, Iowa was founded in 1851, and it gets its namesake from a poker game where uh, Judge Seth Anderson was able to name the town because he won the poker game. Now, he named the town Cordon after his hometown, Cordon, Indiana. Now, because we get a, a name from a different state, I want to give you the history of how that town got its name as well, so you can understand where Cordon's name comes from. Now, uh, Cordon, Indiana was uh, the territorial and state capital of Indiana from 1813 to 1825, and was founded by William Henry Harrison. That name is probably familiar to you because he not only was he the first governor of Indiana, but he would later serve as the ninth president of the United States. Now, as uh, Mr. Harrison would buy up a bunch of land, other prosperous people in the area would also buy all these huge tracts of land in what is now Harrison County, Indiana. Now, when he was trying to seek out a name for this town, he asked one of his good friends, his younger daughters, her name was Jenny Smith, about a name for the town. Now, Jenny knew that uh, Mr. Harrison really liked this uh, old hymn known as the Pastoral Elegy. Now, the pastoral elegy is about a shepherd boy named Corden who tragically dies in the story. Now, because uh, Mr. Harrison liked this story so much, she decided to name the, the community Corden. And that's where Corden, Indiana gets its name, and it would later get, grant its name to Corden, Iowa. Sadly, though, for Mr. Harrison, uh, after serving uh, as the governor of Indiana, he would become the ninth president of the United States. However, during his inaugural speech, uh, the weather was much worse than what it was than it is here today, and he contracted pneumonia, dying only 90 days into his term. Uh, he is the shortest serving president of the United States and wasn't really able to accomplish much during his 90 days in office. But he lends his name, the, uh, the, the name to Cordon, Indiana, and Cordon, Iowa. So he does have a legacy in that aspect. Now, Wayne County, uh, the county seat for Wayne County, it wasn't a, a, a clear cut for Cordon. Cordon did have a rival in determining which would be the county seat, and that actual rival city wasn't even quite ready to become a town yet, and that was the, the, the village of Allerton. Allerton was actually founded uh, just a few miles to that direction in the southwest of here, and it was more designed to be a more of a railroad, railroad depot and didn't really have like a plot like Cordon had. So it was very, very touch and go at the, at the, at the time, but as the county started to develop, um, Cordon pretty easily won out because now Wayne County, even though it was founded in 18, uh, kind of organized in 1846, it was still part of the Appanoose County. It was all administered by Appanoose County, and it wasn't until 51 when Cord was able to officially become a, the, a city and the county seat that it take over its own administrative duties. Uh, and that's where they started looking at building the first courthouse, which was on the square, and that. The building was built in 1856. Now that building served for quite a while, but by 1890 it had fallen into district, district repair and this was a time where all these counties were building these magnificent two, two three-story Victorian style buildings with these big clock towers and Wayne County was no different. Wayne County built this uh, building in 1890 that served all the way up until 1964. Now this beautiful building was uh, disassembled and then moved to uh, a rural part of the county and use as a home. Now, I've been trying to find this building uh, for quite a while, so if anyone has any background on where this building's at, please let me know, because I would like to go do a little bit more history on the building, because it's fascinating. A lot of buildings in, the, in this area were repurposed after their initial use. Um, some even went back to their initial use back and forth several times. Now, the building behind me was built in 1964. Um, this was a period where a lot of courthouses in Iowa, especially Especially the southern tiers of counties were trying to show that they were modern and they wanted to have a new modern look for their county. Wayne County was one of them along with a lot of the other counties like Mills, Union, Des Moines County. A lot of counties revamped their courthouses from the early 1950s to the early 1970s. A lot of people kind of nag on these buildings saying that they're not as pretty, that they're not very nice and even though they, they, they're not the Victorian buildings that are most of Iowa, they have their own cultural significance. There is a degree in American architecture, an American um, kind of 
prog progressing, moving forward as represented in these buildings. And so to just discredit them as being uh, bad cases of, of judgment for the county supervisors and the people at that time, I think it shows the, the vast changes in our American history and moving forward that we should never discourage. We still can remember and, uh, and cherish the past, but also remember that we also need to move forward. And these buildings show that you can kind of do both. And they have their own cultural significance to these to those counties today. So uh, I do like the building. I, I use it quite a bit for, for county business. This is the county which I reside in. So I don't nag on the newer buildings. I think they're just as cool. They have their own flavors. Now. The history of how Wayne County gets its name and the person Wayne County gets its name from, I think is actually the most fascinating story about this. Because anyone who's ever been to Wayne County knows that this place is pretty wild. Um, it's The place is not zoned. Everyone does what they want. If it's legal or not, they don't seem to care. That's Wayne County and that's actually most of Southern Iowa. Uh, don't forget, during the beginnings of Iowa as a territory, there was an immediate war with Missouri over the border dispute, known as the Honey War, which I did a video on already. But Missouri and Iowa, Wayne County was part of that just towards the very end of it, as far as the Honey War and the Hairy Nation uh, that Iowa was awarded by the Supreme Court. And so the fact that they picked Anthony, Mad Anthony Wayne, to be the namesake of their county, I think is absolutely fascinating. Now, Mad Anthony Wayne uh, was born in, in uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania, January 1st of 1745. Now, during the Revolutionary War, he, he, his, his craziness, uh, it was an exemplify of how to defeat the British. And he got the nickname Mad Anthony Wayne because of his just absolute monstrosity as far as going into battle, uh, winning wars, taking very little prisoners, and just making a mess of things. He was awarded the rank of Brigadier General throughout most of the war, and just at the end of the war in 1783, he was promoted to Major General just before he resigned his commission and went to political service. Now, he served in the Pennsylvania uh, uh, State House for a brief moment in time, but he was awarded land in Georgia from his military service and moved down to Georgia to partake in, in the Georgia part of, of, of this delegate convention to ratify the U.S. Constitution. And he would also serve as the uh, member of Congress for Georgia's first district in the second U.S. Congress. But he would be removed from office because they didn't claim, he claimed that they claimed that he did not have proper residency in Georgia. And he decided once he got thrown out, he wasn't going to go back in. Some interesting things about his time in political office was that he was part of the anti-administration party. Now this was against the, the administration of George Washington. He was part of the offshoot of the anti-federalist party, which was mostly James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, in rebuke of uh, Washington's pick for uh, Secretary Treasurer Alexander Hamilton. They were staunch opponents of Hamilton, and in, in many cases, thorns in the side of George Washington, who, because the Constitution wasn't quite ratified yet, wasn't even yet president of the United States. And so the Anti-Federalist group, along with Ed Anthony Wayne, was really fighting against the ratification of the Constitution. And his major allies were the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence and wrote the Constitution itself, pushing forward to the Bill of Rights that we all cherish, you know, the first 10 uh, amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Now, when he went to serve in the Georgia delegation for the U.S. Constitutional Convention, he, he, they were able to, to ratify the Constitution in Georgia, and that's when he would then serve his term in the U.S. House of Representatives. But it just really wasn't a good fit for him. Uh, his pure hatred towards the administration didn't really help that much. And George Washington decided the best way to get rid of him is to put him back into where he was a known success, and that is in the military service. So he puts him in charge of the Legion of the United States and sends them to the Ohio country to clean up a lot of the problems that they were having with the Indians. Now, the Indians were uniting at this time period into a, into a confederation that was even backed by members of the British Parliament and uh, British garrisons within the Midwest, like the city of Detroit, which was an American fort, was traded hands to the British even throughout the uh, War of 1812. And so all these forts that were either forts made founded by French, by the Brits, uh, by Spanish. Uh, he was sitting towards the time to take control of all this stuff. And he had a, a log, a huge 
tree branch full onto his tent, knock him unconscious. He quickly was able to recover and took back con control of his armed forces. And he was actually one of the leading uh, military officers to defeat the Confederation of Indians in the Battle of Greenfield and actually took uh, this fight completely out of the Indians, moving to moving them further westward and allowing for American expansion into the Ohio country. Without Mad Anthony Wayne and a lot of the the military uh, tours he did, there's a chance that the United States might not have been able to take control of this territory as soon as they did, pushing off Manifest Destiny for even two or three generations. So it's, it's very, very important that you know men like Mad Anthony Wayne were in the fight at the times that they were to lead to where we are as a country today. Now I can't say that I, I'm, you know, everything that we did as a country at that time was a, a major plus for our cultural history because you know Indians were mistreated and we did have some problems with how or our Indian relations up until the 1870s. But it's part of our entire story, and it's just part of history that we all should learn and understand from. Now, while still serving in the military service. Uh, he was he did die uh, near Erie, Pennsylvania due to complications from being outside all the time. Uh, he was buried uh, near a fort near Erie, Pennsylvania, but his son uh, dug him up in 1809 and moved him to what is to what is now Wayne, Pennsylvania in a family plot. Sadly though, not all of his bones made it and he is actually credited to having two burial sites. Now, since a lot of his bones were scattered, you know, you know, unfortunately, along Route 322, it is known and believed that he actually rises um, in a spiritual form on January 1st, which is his birthday every year, and travels this route throughout Pennsylvania looking for his uh, missing body parts. I think it's a little weird, a little cool, but that's an interesting story about the guy who Wayne County's named after still out kicking it along Route 322 in Pennsylvania. And, I mean, chances are you can go meet the guy, uh, or at least his spirit in, in any case. But I think this is really interesting part of the county history of the guy who the county's named after. Another really cool claim to fame for Gordon in Wayne County, Indiana, uh, Wayne County, Indiana, Wayne County, Iowa, uh, is that we are a site of a Jesse James bank robbery. Jesse James robbed a bank here known as the Ockelbach Brothers Bank on June 3rd, 1871. Now this is just after the Chicago fire, and this is, you know, the time that like, when the Franco-Prussian Wars were happening, and Germany became a country versus just a bunch of German tribes, kind of a, the, the, the world history at the time. Jesse James was kicking it in court and robbing, knocking up banks. The whole town was deserted, however, on June 3rd. The only person within, uh, anywhere nearby was the teller of the bank. Now, Jesse James felt kind of robbed from being having this massive you know uh kind of romantic getaway into the sunset so he went and notified the townspeople and he traveled to uh, this little church where everyone was gathered and uh, the rumor has it they came across a young boy and he flipped the the, the boy a uh a silver coin and it told him to be a messenger to let the, the townspeople know that he had just robbed around six to ten thousand dollars from the city bank and which response was like this is this is no money here, uh, but the significance of this bank robbery is that bec this actually started getting bank robberies outside of the out of Kansas and Missouri, where Jesse James was from, and this started bringing in other big name uh, police agencies like the Pickerton family, you know, the people who tracked down John Wilkes Booth in 1865. They got more onto the trail, of the searching for the Jesse James gang, and the pressure started mounting. Many of the members of the gang would fall off, be arrested, die, and, and Jesse had to replace his gang members because of the pressure put on from the specific bank robbery, leading to a couple of his gang members actually deciding to, take, to turn coat and take the reward money, killing Jesse James as he was a, a fixing a picture on the wall to, to receive the, the reward money. And if it wasn't for this bank robbery, there's a chance that Jesse James might have been able to etch it out for, for maybe more, a little more than the decade that he did after this bank robbery. So that's basically kind of you know the, the gist of Wayne County. The, I'm doing another video on the, the Tharp Cemetery, which is closer to the Missouri border, which has a huge historical significance for the Mormons, the Mormon Trail. But it's so significant, I want to actually do the video at the cemetery because it has a huge uh, 
component for, uh, part of history for the Mormons and our history as a nation as a whole. And so I'm going to do that video separately uh, for that cemetery. I also want to dedicate this video to uh, Ed Henry from Fox News who sent me this wonderful tie. Uh, Ed Henry is, I think, one of the best uh, journalists on TV. He was with CNN. He's down with Fox News. Uh, he's a great baseball uh, fan, which I, I am as well. And he sent me this tie, which I'm very uh, thankful of. So thank you, Ed Henry. You can catch him uh, weekdays uh, from 9 a.m. to noon on, on Fox News Channel. That's Eastern Time, by the way. So check your local listings for the time for your local uh, uh, channels. But he's a really great reporter. He's on TV a lot, uh, covering for other anchors as they you know, bow out or take vacation time. So he's on TV a lot, but he's one of the nicest people in the business that I've, I've ever met, and I've met a lot of them at this point. And so I want to give a special thanks out to Fox News and Ed Henry for the tie. I really appreciate your friendship, man. And uh, to everyone in Iowa, stay healthy, stay wealthy, stay wise. And as always, stay classy, Iowa.